Okay, hi, I'm Melinda Hall. I'm calling in from New York City and I am the moderator for tonight's panel entitled Managing Difficult Emotions. Um, there's something here I would like to share with you from the sag After Foundation. And this is the introduction. Welcome to the sag After Foundation's The Business Program. Um, I am Melinda. I am a actor, a director, a producer, and a sag After member. And just a reminder that this program is not meant to serve as a clinical evaluation for any specific individual. We would instead like to present ways of thinking about mental health that is specific to actors and performers. And you can find additional resources in the description. And it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. So first off, I have Anjali Deva, who is a Ayurvedic practitioner. Hi, Anjali, welcome. Thank you. Can you say a little something about your practice? Sure. Yeah, I'm Anjali and I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner in Los Angeles. Ayurveda is a indigenous medical system from India. So it's a holistic mind body way of approaching our health through diet, through lifestyle, through nutrition and counseling. Oh, wonderful. Great. And next I have Tonya Jones, who is an expert in uh, meditation. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, yes, I am a meditation teacher. I work with a, diff a number of different organizations, um, educational institutions. I also do some work with uh, UCLA, and I also work with young people on um, mindfulness retreats. Welcome. And we also have Janice Lee Moskowitz. And let's see. Oh, there you are. Janice, tell us a bit about your practice. Sure. Hi, I'm Janice, and uh, I'm a licensed therapist um, in uh, at a private practice in New York uh, called Wolf Therapy. Uh, the practice um, specializes in providing intersectional care, and um, the mission's focus is providing an inclusive space for uh, clinicians and clients. Wonderful. And we also have um, Dr. Robin Smith. Hello, Dr. Robin. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. There. Hello. How are you? Great. So, yes, give us a little short blurb about what you're doing, what you're up to. Yeah, I am a licensed psychologist. Um, also, um, I am a corporate uh, trainer and uh, do a lot of executive and um, life coaching. I have spent a lot of time. Uh, in front of the camera as well. So I am a part of SAG-AFTRA as a, on the acting um, side, I've spent a lot of time on television and also a radio show on Sirius XM. But what I do uh, and what I help other people do is really convert suffering into usable currency because suffering by itself can, uh, be overwhelming for all of us. And so what I invite people to do and what I've done in my own personal life is to take the heartache and the heartbreak, um, the things that felt unimaginable that have shown up at my own front door and uh, found a way, um, a prescription, wake up, show up, grow up, rise up to take that which was debilitating and convert it um, to convert hardship and adversity into purpose and power. Oh, beautiful. I think we all need to learn more about that tonight. Absolutely. Um, so I was telling the panel before we started the meeting that my questions were, how did this pandemic lead each of you to learn new ways to help your clients? So um, I don't, I, I always feel uncomfortable about calling about calling on people. Maybe they're not ready for their answer yet or whatever. So if you are ready to give an answer to that question and you'd like to, um, please, please unmute yourself and let's hear that. I think one of the unique challenges um, around working with people, there, there was a lot of things I didn't mention in my intro, but also, um, you know, do a lot of like one-on-one -on -one work and uh, mentoring and was also working with um, a number of uh, activists too um, during this time 
um, through some healing justice um, work. You know, I would say one of the, the main things I was noticing is that, you know, oftentimes with that work, it was before the pandemic, it was more about like, how can I bring my practice like off the seat or cushion, so to speak? Like, how can I, um, you know, bring like mindfulness into my daily life, into my relationships and communication and work and, you know, all those things, you know, where it's not um, just a formal practice where you sit down and then it's like out the window. <laughs> um, and with the shift though, with, you know, so much like isolation and people, you know, just kind of dealing with uncertainty, um, was more around like how to find more uh, comfort and refuge and silence, um, how to work with um, the inner life and the things that are coming up around that and a lot around um, impermanence. Impermanence was a big thing and how to ride the waves of impermanence and how like the formal practice can really inform like how um, we can work with impermanence. So that was a shift where it was more inward than outward facing. Yes, I, I guess I get what you're saying. And so if someone's new to meditation, is there something that they, that you could recommend that's like helps break the ice for them if they feel uncomfortable about it? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, not biting off uh, a lot <laughs> in the beginning because some people may feel like, you know, if I don't have an hour to sit or if I'm not going on this 10 day retreat or something that, you know, even like starting with five or 10 minutes and kind of building um, a habit, like isn't worth it. Like I only have this amount of time, so I'm just not going to do that where there could be real benefit and just, you know, taking a, a few minutes of time. Um, I think there, there are also, um, there are different kinds of meditation, you know, like I have a practice more in the insight tradition, but there are other ways of meditating. So I would say exploring different types of meditating if one isn't working for you, um, different uh, teachers. And then there's also even with like more um, mindfulness and insight, a lot of times you're you know, working with the breath, but there are other things that you could work with, like with sound or, you know, definitely working with the body, which is a big part of um, that uh, pre practice. Um, you know, so walking meditation also is a, a formal practice that people don't realize, but it's not kind of like when you walk down the street to the store and aimlessly like, yeah, how did I get here? You know, it's like all that, like really paying attention uh, to the body. There's open awareness practices. So I think, you know, there are just different ways that you could um, think about practice. But again, also, I think one of the main things is that it is an isolated thing that only happens when you're mm -hmm. yeah like small doses might be good okay great so anyone else want to answer how did the pandemic lead you to learn new ways to help your clients anyone else have an answer for that one you get five points you get five points i'd be happy to share um so a lot of what i do is in the realm of self-care in particular around our digestion and our sleep wake cycles and what was really lovely about the pandemic is that since we were so isolated and at home, most of us were in charge of the food that we were eating, uh, which wasn't the case pre-pandemic. So it's been really lovely to be able to work with people on tailored uh, meal plans, tailored digestive plans, because we each have such unique digestive systems. And our digestive systems are really our gut brain. They're intuitive, they're intelligent, they have a lot of capacity for emotions. And when we are experiencing deep emotion like grief or isolation or sorrow, that shows up in our digestive systems most of the time. And in Ayurveda, we believe that our digestion is really the seat of our health, how we take care of our digestion impacts everything else. And we see that now with all of this research on the microbiome coming out. But it's been beautiful to be able to watch people really take more action in their self-care because they have more time. They're not driving to and from work as much. They, you know, might be able to sneak out during a Zoom meeting and make their lunch for the day. They're not running down to the Starbucks on the corner. There's a lot more sense of empowerment around our self-care routines and also being able to find sleep-wake cycles that follow closer to the sun. So going to the bed, going to bed closer to when the sun goes down, waking up before the sun 
sun rises and staying in that circadian rhythm is so impactful for your digestive system, your reproductive system, your immunity, all of these different systems within the body. So for me, I think it's been really fascinating to watch how being at home has actually been beneficial in a lot of ways. So I'll pass it on. Yeah, I think not also eating on a schedule. I love I love eating when I'm hungry. And I know that sounds elementary, but when you work for other people, you don't always get to eat when you're hungry. You're kind of forced to eat when it's convenient for them. Um, yeah, <laughs> like on set. <laughs> You know, okay. One, yeah, Whatever. one of the things yes. that yeah that I uh, would like to surface, particularly as we're talking about um, actors and performers, is what it meant for people to feel terrified that the way in which they create meaning and connection and belonging was jeopardized. And without a sense of any control uh, in terms of the pandemic and also the racial unrest and trauma that was going, you know, that was happening in the US as well as around the world. And so the issue of grief is so huge, not only the people who died from COVID. Uh, and who also, you know, got very sick and are still struggling to recover, but grieving life as we knew it, um, grieving some of the securities that we had. And there is something about how fragile and robust we were all in the same breath, all in the same moment. And so I hope that tonight, part of what we're doing, and by the way, I'm in Philadelphia, so that's the reason I'm saying tonight, some of us are on the East Coast, some on the West. Um, but in this moment, what my own desire is for myself and for everyone who has gathered is that we can take our masks off and not the ones that we've been wearing um, to keep us safe and depending upon where we are in the country and politically and all of those other things. But um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, we wear the mask that grins and lies. And so I'm hoping tonight um, that we can create safe space to explore not only um, the world and COVID, but our inner worlds and what happened to us, what happened to me um, in the midst of this isolation? What did I discover about myself? You know, what did I discover about my primary relationships uh, that were, that was affirming? And also some of us learned that some of the people we were connected with, that those relationships were unhealthy. And so I'm, that's some of what I personally learned, but also what I've been helping people work through. Thank you. Yes. Janice, do you want to write on that thought? Um, sure. Um, uh, I think it's taught me through my work over the pandemic, um, how people really adapted and um, had to use flexibility in ways that um, they haven't before. Um, and so there was a sense of communal grief and loss that I was witnessing. And there is something um, so moving about that. I think even to show up in the therapy space, um, I think therapists often have to, are focusing on, on the client and their individual pain, but something about the pandemic, I think, allowed people to show up in a more real way. Um, and so I think, um, uh, yeah, just a learning also to adapt to that and learning to connect through the painful emotions. Yeah, so when I was asked about this panel, the title was Managing Difficult Emotions. And so then I was thinking, so what are difficult emotions? And when Robin started talking about grief, I can definitely connect with that for myself as a difficult emotion. But I also found this feelings wheel. And I don't know if that will help anyone, but I wanted to see if we can flash it on the screen. If anyone wants to comment on it, how you could articulate feelings 
And then what do you do to process those feelings? There you go. Okay. So anyone want to talk about this feelings wheel? Um, Has anyone worked with this? Yeah, I have um, worked with it. And I think what's interesting about even the title of this panel in terms of difficult emotions, and we talked about this a little bit before we uh, went live, is that difficult emotions are not necessarily negative. Um, matter of fact, they're not negative. I, I think the this you know polarized good, bad, negative, positive, to be alive is to have feelings all around that wheel. And not just for, um, I mean, for me, meaning me, the clinician. Um, I also am an ordained minister. That's something that people don't necessarily know. So there are ways in which we attribute, you know, positivity to happiness or joy and negativity to anger uh, or sadness. But the truth of the matter is our feelings and that feeling wheel, they're all information. And really, I think if we can, in this moment, again, invite for ourselves like a safe space for my feelings, all of them to be welcomed. So if we're angry, that's really good information for us um, to understand, like I'm, I'm triggered. What are my triggers? And what is it that my body and my brain and my burdens are trying to alert me to? You know, we know that if a woman has a lump in her breast or a man has an enlarged prostate, that that's information. Um, And so sadness and anger and joy and all of those other feelings on the wheel are wonderful um, moments to inform us that there is something stirring on the inside that wants our attention. Yes. Sometimes it's more than stirring, right? Like sometimes it's like, you know, like it just comes off and grabs you. Um, from my own life, I think sometimes I don't expect it. You know, what do we do about these emotions, especially when you're in the pandemic and you are feeling lonely or you cannot get work or you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling upset, you know, and I think meditation and the uh, Ayurvedic philosophies definitely are very supportive. Um, And if anyone wants to give a little particular exercise, so for example, you can use me as an example today, I got rejected from a job application and I thought I was really qualified for it and completely uh, not even an interview, just like, no. And so what I ended up doing was go for a walk and I love shooting pictures. So I went for a walk and I like took a lot of pictures of flowers. <laughs> That's just me. So what else could someone do? Like when they get those rejection letters and, or emails, when you, what can you do besides revenge? I guess. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anybody hop on? Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like uh, Melinda, you, actually knew how to take care of yourself in the moment intuitively. Um, I think, you know, going off also on what Dr. Robin said, I think it's to create a safe space and curiosity for your feelings. Um, I think often when people are avoiding their emotions, they have this um, fear, also false beliefs around emotions itself. Um, Emotions are an inconvenience. Emotions are um, make you incompetent, whatever these false beliefs are. So once you kind of are aware of that, you can start to create curiosity. Um, what are some of these feelings? Um, where do they live in my body? When have I experienced it before? Um, and the more awareness you have, you're better able to react, make informed decisions that feel right for you. One of the things that I was thinking about before today was coping mechanism. So during the pandemic, I know probably people drank more alcohol than they might've before. You know, how do you have a coping mechanism that isn't harmful to you or isn't a depressant or isn't like a kind of a a go-to that might not be so healthy? What do you do in those impulses when you want to self-soothe, but it's actually 
like an odd message or it gets cross wires. Uh, um, I'm especially looking uh, to Anjali and to uh, Tonya for this one, because I think those practices uh, could help when someone has the impulse to um, drink to make themselves feel better or to get high to feel better or something. I don't know. Uh, Talk to me. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. And, you know, one of the things that I like to remind people that I work with is that emotions are in our body and in the tradition that I come from, you know, emotions and our heart are, is actually the mind. So when we experience emotions, they're in the body, even though sometimes we tend to think that we're thinking about it so much. But really what's happening is that we're experiencing distress or discomfort in the body. And what happens when we experience distress or discomfort is we want to move away from it, right? So when I'm placing my hand on a hot stove, I have a natural reflection to move away from it. So similarly, when I experience fear, I experience anger, I experience sorrow, I experience grief, rejection, like you mentioned, my first instinct and in a way a sense of survival is to step away from it, to ignore it, to turn the other way. And something that we say in Ayurveda is that when we are out of balance, we crave what keeps us out of balance. So I'm going to crave the extra coffee or the extra sugar or the glass of alcohol that helps me stay away from that painful experience in my body. And so if I can listen to, and we all have a wisdom voice that's saying, maybe that glass of wine isn't right, or maybe that cup of coffee isn't right. And, you know, maybe over time we choose to listen to it, or maybe over time we choose to ignore it, but there is a choice there in how we respond to that uncomfortable sensation. And most of the time, the emotions actually don't last that long if we can be with the felt sense of them. So that might mean that I need to cry. That might mean that I need to stretch. That might mean that, like you did, I need to go for a walk. But recognizing that it's a discomfort within my body that needs to move through so that I can feel more at ease mentally. I can feel more at ease with myself. But I think really coming back to, okay, this hurts. Where does this hurt? Does this hurt in my belly? Does this hurt in my heart? Do my limbs need to move? How can I feel this? Which I think I'm probably speaking to a bunch of people who know how to do that in some way, shape or form. So it's about doing that for ourselves in the most difficult moments and and really trusting that we can, that we can meet ourselves and sit with or be with those emotions that are arising. Tonya, does this lend itself to like the concentration or the time limit thing that you're talking about, perhaps meditating for shorter periods of time? Or what happens when you have those intrusive thoughts when you do want to meditate and take it down? Is there a tip that you can have to share with the audience? Yeah, so much of what I was said and shaking my head because it resonates with me. And especially that initial impulse around, um, you know, wanting to push something away. I I feel like... um, you know, half the battle, so to speak, is one just like recognizing what's happening and without the judgment or making it good or bad, or like, I have to change this. I have to do something right now. Um, and, you know, in some ways it, I do feel like there's that kind of survival, um, you know, kind of mechanism that kicks in, but sometimes it can be confused. Like our lives aren't in danger, you know? And so, you know, if, it, if we're having um, a difficult emotion, you know, we're probably not going to expire at that time, you know? So, you know, it's one, I think that that distance to have that perspective, like to see this thing and it, you know, it kind of relates to the impermanence piece too, because, you know, if, if I kind of feeding whatever that is, that's, you know, with the emotion, like instead of going down the thought train, I can pay attention to my body. And, and that's a choice because those thoughts and the stories are kind of a distraction from being with what's really happening emotionally and in the body. Um, so for me, even that, like that quick distinction of kind of what's there and again, like shifting back to the body and being curious about what's happening in the body. 
So for example, um, for me with anger, I know exactly where it lives, what it feels like, what the size of the ball is, how hot it gets, if it pulses, kind of all, I, I, I know where that is. And even other emotions that might be, you know, labeled more pleasant, like I know where those live. So when things arise, instead of kind of giving my attention to, you know, all of the, the thoughts and things that are feeding something that isn't wholesome for me, it's like, that's not working. Um, I turn back to my body and kind of pay attention to what's really there in my breath and seeing like, oh, that's interesting. And usually even shifting that attention and bringing that awareness and just allowing it to be there and really looking at it helps dissipate some of that, you know, pretty, uh, pretty quickly. So I would say that's, you know, that's one of the quick things, um, you know, that you're speaking about that is really, it's that, I would say what, you know, mindfulness practice just in general, like there's that space in between of the noticing and reactivity. And that is, I think, what that um, practice over time kind of retrains the brain to have that space. So you can make that. Right. So there's more of a gap between when I notice a feeling that's uncomfortable before I like hop into action or spring into defense about it. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get what you're saying. Reactivity. Okay. So um, I've been getting a lot, I have a live document going with Psych After Foundation. They're giving me lots and lots of questions from members. So I'm wondering maybe if I should just hop into that because it might take long and yeah, okay. Yeah, Dr. Jen, uh, yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah, do it. Okay, so, woo, okay, senior performers. How can we specifically help senior performers who don't see a lot of opportunities coming their way, who may be frustrated with the technology of all self-taping now, who might feel out of the loop, and really feel uh, some, someone's writing that they feel a bit um, not, not, not embarrassed to even ask for help about not being able to do a self taper to get it done. And then it just makes them feel worse. Anybody have any help for senior um, performers? You know, I have a, a thought and it's really related to that question and also what we were just talking about in terms of reactivity and curiosity that, you know, whether it's a senior performer who's struggling and what I would say is not only with technology, but with the cycle of humanity. And so a part of uh what might soften uh, what feels so painful for the senior performer is for that person as well as this collective body to normalize what it means to be human and to ask for help and to not know, like to live in the power of not knowing and meaning not knowing maybe what other people know. You know, sometimes when I'm jogging or I'm walking and I'll kind of play this um, game, if you will, with myself, there's someone always who seems to be going faster than me. And I have stories about them. And then I see people who are not going as fast as I'm going and I make up that they have stories about me. And so I wonder if for the senior performer, this is an opportunity uh, to leave the stories that other people are writing for you about what it means to be of a certain age or not knowing how to maybe even access the Google Doc that you have questions coming into and how to create belonging with people who are invested in being human. Because once we meet other people on the path, whether it's jogging or it's performing, and we see the humanity of someone who is trying to figure out how to master the moment. And mastering the moment doesn't mean getting it perfect. It means being present fully to it. And so I, I just would invite the senior performer, but also all performers and actors 
to tap into what really is the common denominator right here, right now. And that is both the fragility and the robust resilience of being human. Great. Um, Janice, would you like to um, talk a little bit about this too? Do you have clients that um, you work with? Sure. So it's actually making me think about my work with the Actors Fund, and I primarily worked with in career counseling there with performers and, and artists and uh, people working in the performing arts. And yeah, one common theme was um, actually around um, ageism that does exist. Um, and so I do think that um, there needs to be a space where um, people can actually uh, feel validated in that, that it's also just not in their head too. And, and there are times when their age is used against them and, um, and they're not seen or heard. And so I do think that leaning on community and other artists too with these shared experiences might be helpful when they're dealing with some of these emotions too. Um, uh, and I think that will also better allow them to then communicate their needs and to lean on each other and to, to grow from that. Yeah, I think the Actors Fund is a great resource for getting in touch with people, you know, and, and learning about different techniques and creating friendships, relationships, possible work opportunities. And so is SAG After Foundation for learning how to do some of the technical things. Every day in my mailbox, I get a nice email about, hey, you can take this voiceover lab or you can do this. And I know it takes courage. I know it takes courage to sign up and maybe you get shut out and then you have to remember to sign up again. Or even like when I was trying to find a counselor a couple of years ago, it was so hard to find one that would accept my insurance. And so I was having, you know, I was really into depression. I was just recently post COVID and I, I felt like even like chasing leads, chasing leads was rough, you know? So how do you create that kind of uh, resilience when you get, when you don't have leads, you know, or you think you don't have leads and you can, it can very easily turn into something unpleasant or feeling unpleasant. Anyone want to chime in on that? And I did find a counselor after all. So, <laughs> but it did take a lot of tenacity. It took a lot of strength to do that. Melinda, I just want to also say something because you shared your own journey today. And first, thank you for doing so, because that's also how we create community which is to take the mask off and say, my day was hard today and I got a rejection and I was really qualified and I felt really good about this. And so I want to first thank you for setting the, you know, really the, the stage for the power and vulnerability. The other thing you were talking about just now is when something happens and you know, the actor's fund or finding a therapist about tenacity. And it's hard to be tenacious when we are depleted. And so I just want to remind all of us how important, and, and everyone on the panel has already said this, but that self-care is not a negotiable if we want to have flexibility and tenacity, that self-care becomes really a necessity. And how we learn to take care of ourselves really is a spiritual practice, not a religious practice, but it is a spiritual practice to give to ourselves in that way. So I just wanted to thank you for sharing that and um, showing us the way. Oh, I'm so happy you're all in front of me. I was thinking like, as a just when I got invited, like, okay, who wants to hear about my problems? <laughs> but I'm just teasing. Okay, I want to jump to one of the questions from the document here. This says, do you, does anyone have any tips dealing with a partner who's also in the business and then managing emotions regards to feeling competitive? Oh, okay. Anyone want to help? 
you know, and, and it and it feels kind of cliche, but it, it but it feels true to me. <laughs> um, the the first thing that comes to mind is around like scarcity, um, you know, and how that shows up, and and oftentimes it it's something that I don't feel like it just comes out, you know, it, when you become a performer, it could be something that's there, that's a mindset that's there, like long before that. And this could be like just the situation or the breeding ground or catalyst to kind of bring that up to light when there's something right in front of you pushing against it. You know, sometimes like you don't really know who you are until something comes up. It's like, oh, that's how I would deal with that. <laughs> you know, and I feel like that's one of those things around um, that the mindset of there's not enough. Um, you know, because what I've seen and just even from my own experience, it was like, yeah, was I, when I was in a partnership and with a performer, it's not like we're going in for the same stuff. We're not going to get the same opportunity. Like, you know, I mean, we're so far apart, you know, so, and like anything we would be doing, um, which is the case for a lot of people. So then, you know, I really kind of had to examine like more in myself, like, what is this about? Like, where is this coming from? Um, you know, there's no real threat. I mean, even that mentality in general can be, you know, limiting, um, even just in this business. And, and I'm sure people could relate to that, that, you know, that it has not been <laughs> fruitful when going down that road, um, even just for our own mental health. Um, but yeah, so for me, it was really like examining that, that mindset and also trying, looking at like, what is the root of that? Like what, what's really there that I need to work with because it's not my, my partner and it's not like, if he gets a one up and I don't like the, it, it, it wasn't about that. And I don't want to say what it is because it could be different for different people. Like what's really at the root of that. But I think just generally speaking, it's more of like looking at that and seeing, um, you know, what is at the root of that. Um, and another thing that just comes up for me, um, which I feel like applies here, but just more generally speaking, um, what I've come to learn is that there is not one thing that is going to make me happy forever. <laughs> you know, like whatever it is, I accomplish this thing, I get this new thing, whatever it is, it's like that kind of, um, I guess, happiness that is attached to attainment is not sustainable. Um, you know, it, it comes and goes. And that's really helped me a lot because there are things that I'm just like, I just want this so bad, or I deserve this, or I need this. And if I don't, then I'm not going to be happy. But I've had experiences where I got exactly what I worked hard for and thought I deserved. And then a month later, I was unhappy about something else, <laughs> you know? So it really has kind of given me that perspective of like a, a sense of peace and contentment can still exist versus this idea of like attachment to things and that is what brings happiness. So then when things come, it's like, yeah, I can enjoy them and really be present without like clinging, like this has to stay forever. But then when I go, don't get those things, I don't have to kind of go way, way, way downhill either. Um, you, know, you remind me of, um, you just reminded me of that New York Times article that came out a couple of months ago where it said parents shouldn't teach their children how to be happy. They should teach their children how to manage frustration. Hmm. And I felt like as actors and performers, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's laughing, yes, because we don't talk about that in acting school. And I have taught in many acting schools for mm. almost 20 years. And nobody talks about, okay, when you don't get it, how do you manage frustration? So perhaps we can chat with, that could be a difficult emotion. Um, anyone want to weigh in on frustration? Sure. I think just to piggyback off of what was just being said is, you know, we spoke about this aversion to, you know, wanting to turn away and move away from difficulty. We also can have strong attachment to, just as you were saying. And so when I want something so badly, it becomes just the one thing that I focus on, right? Like this coconut water is going to make me so happy. It's going to change my life. I'm going to be so hydrated. I'm going to be the best version of myself. Right. And then I lose sight of my value system. I lose sight of what I believe in. I lose sight of my grounding. All of my energy kind of flows up into my head. And in Ayurveda, we would call this a sense of rajas, a sense of craving, a sense of activity that I just can't seem to settle. No matter how hard I try, I can't seem to settle that. And so for some of us, that'll manifest as fear. For some of us, that'll manifest 
manifest as frustration or anger. And for some, that might be more of like a freeze, a shutdown, a, a softening and not being able to move forward. It's going to manifest differently for all of us. But that sense of frustration is representing the same thing, which is that I am craving, I'm desiring, I'm looking outside of myself for these things that I hope are going to change my life, make me happy, make me feel content, when really that is somewhere within me. I already do have that to some degree. So how can I stay rooted in that? How can I find that within myself again? And it doesn't mean that hard things won't happen, right? It doesn't mean that we just turned a blind eye and we're going to ignore that that thing happened. But how do I not let it rule my entire life, my entire vision, you know, so that I don't have blindfolds on or not blindfolds, what are they called? You know, uh, these things. Yeah, blinders, yeah. <laughs> blinders, yeah. yes, to the other things that are going on in my life. I get really narrow in my focus. But- what you just said rings so many bells because in the pandemic, I find I, I'm not a shopper. I don't like shopping, but in the pandemic, I find myself thinking, oh, well, if I could go to the store, then I could get that thing. You know, did anyone else experience that the quest? And then you're right. It didn't necessarily make me, you know, solve all my life problems. But is that also part of a post pandemic sensation of needing to get something satisfied, perhaps anybody um, have a thought on that? Yes. And I think what you're experiencing is so common. You know, most of us are, I mean, look at the housing bubble that's been created. Look at how Amazon stock has been increased. I mean, you know, all of this is indicative of what you're saying. And I think we always have a way of looking outside of ourselves, but especially when it feels like we can't even go outside, you know, it just becomes so much more heightened. We're so much more aware of it. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to do a few more questions here. Some of these are toughies. So here we go. What do you do when you want to talk to someone and they scream at you and interrupt you and over talk on you? Ah. Well, I mean, I think one of the things you do is create a boundary. You know, it's not only safety um, with other people, but it's safety with yourself. So when people say, like, I can't trust um, other people, and what I think is, okay, but you can't trust you to know that you can take care of you in the face of other people who are not necessarily so gracious um, or kind and maybe even abusive. Um, I was working with a group of um performers. And during, at the beginning of the pandemic, their questions were asked, you know, if my parents have like shown up and allowed me to come back, um, but they want to treat me like a child and are, you know, talking in ways that are disrespectful to who I am, what do I owe them? And I think the questions we ask ourselves are important. It's not what do you owe your parents or your partner is what do you owe yourself? And if we can start with the question, like, what do I owe me and how can I take care of myself with boundaries? I mean, boundaries are a huge part of self-love and of loving someone else. So if you have someone yelling at you who overtalks you, Uh, the question we might ask, and I think all of the panelists have talked about this, is not what's wrong with them and not even what's wrong with you, but what is being triggered in you that you're losing your voice, that you're losing your power, that you're losing your agency, that someone, that you're interacting with someone who actually thinks it's okay to do that But what's bigger is what's going on in the self that's engaging in a relationship that sounds abusive, toxic, um, negative in some way. And so it's not to blame anyone, but it is to become curious about what is it that I am acting out, that I'm in relationship with someone who has, you know, impulse problems, but It is really about being able to have agency for the self and to have compassion. I mean, that's the other thing. Self-compassion is the foundation 
for real transformation. We can't, uh, and I think as Americans, we often are, you know, this tough um, beat yourself up. You know, if you overeat or you um, take that drink of coffee or too much, to beat yourself up is never going to create a safe foundation for transformation. So curiosity and real genuine self-compassion is essential to look at any of the situations going on in our lives. Okay, anyone else have any comments about that particular question? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I really appreciate um, Dr. Robin mentioning boundaries. I think that's so important and being in a lot of uh, mindfulness spaces, you know, we talk a lot about compassion and sometimes compassion, I feel, can be misinterpreted as like, oh, I have to be in this. Or I've had some of us say to me, like, you know, you got to stand in the fire. And I'm like, mm, no, 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 I don't, you know, <laughs> like that's not. Yeah. So this idea of compassion being like withstanding anything that comes because I care for you and I love you. And this is the way that I show compassion, which, again, just speaking to what you just said, is like, you know, the self-compassion piece isn't there, though. And sometimes the most compassionate act can be saying, hey, this isn't good for me right now, this isn't good for you right now. That's a loving act, you know, versus, you know, um, de-escalating a situation. That is a loving act. Maybe you can't and you can't be in that situation. Um, and just personally, what I have found in, in some situations, um, you know, in similar ways where there are boundaries set, oftentimes that could be the action that really transforms a relationship. Um, that could be the thing that really shifts the other person's behavior, even if that was not um, the, the full intention. And the intention was uh, caring and loving uh, the self. But, um, you know, it's, yeah, and kind of, um, you know, just in the way that, that people treat you and really, you know, it's kind of like, well, if I can get away with this, I, I will, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's just kind of human nature for a, a lot of us, you know, it's not a judgment. Um, so yeah, I, I, the boundary piece I feel is so important and not to be confused with not being a compassionate person um, because you're caring for yourself. Yeah, and the boundaries also um, give you safety. Is that correct? Anyone wanted to speak to that, um, Janice, maybe? About feeling safe in certain ways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also the thing that people struggle with boundaries is that um, I think I, I re de definitely resonate with what Dr. Robin and Tonya already mentioned, which is, oh, like, if I'm setting boundaries, is that something that's unkind? Or um, am I shutting the, am I now like the aggressor? Am I the one that's like doing something negative to people? And I think, um, you know, setting boundaries, um, it, it actually requires you to actually have empathy for yourself and the other person. Um, and so you can still empathize with what people are going through. For example, the person shouting at you, but it doesn't mean you actually condone or excuse that behavior. And so um, I think boundary is all about safety. Without boundaries, relationships aren't actually sustainable. And so um, it's a way you can actually create healthy, sustainable relationships. So I think that can be really tough for people, especially if it's not something that was modeled for them. Um, and so it is really about being able to tune into hey, like I, I see you, like you're in a place where you're hurting and, and I feel for that, uh, but I absolutely um, do not condone this kind of interaction, this kind of behavior and this relationship. And so you're sa setting up safety measures for everyone. Do you think that's sort of gender specific in a way that women might be always like, Mm, hesitant to think that they might be aggressive or think that they might have to lay down boundaries because because the nice <laughs> the nice uh, germ that's been planted in our heads or something or do you think it's men feel that too that they can't relate boundaries anyone want to go for that uh, absolutely and Melinda I mean I, I'm so glad you said that I think emotions 
um, and our experience of emotions are definitely impacted by our gender, um, but all of our other identities and experience experiences, um, our families, our cultural, racial, um, ethnic identities, our socioeconomic status, um, and and that definitely impacts like especially an emotion like anger, I think. Um, and so I think working through your personal and unique identities and experiences will help inform, oh, like, this is my relationship with anger and this is the way it can manifest in my relationships. Yes. Anyone else have a comment on that? Or what about our friends who are non-binary or trans and how they're dealing with some of the emotions? Like, do you have clients that go through that? And any particular help that we can do to be supportive, to be genuine allies and not just performative allies. And what do you all think about what could be helpful right now? Because everybody's everybody's going through something is how I feel about it. But I wanna hear you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that any marginalized group, especially trans and non-binary are may have a more difficult time expressing emotions because that hasn't been safe. You know, that hasn't been as safe historically for them. And, and yet it's still held in the same way, right? That this idea of self-compassion is so rooted in our common humanity and that we all experience suffering and that in our ability to relate to one another's suffering is how we connect with one another. So I think being able to be allies to marginalized groups is really important and to help uplift voices that historically have not had that uplifting is really important for those of us who do have some privilege. Yes, but do is it wise to say to the person, how best can I help you or, because I find sometimes, you know, when I'm lending support, it actually is, it's useful for me to hear what they have to, you know, what could be received positively. Um, anyone want to address that? I think you're talking about respecting the other and not presuming that we know what someone else needs um, just because it would comfort us. So whether we're talking about the trans community, I mean, this is, I was thinking about this today. I mean, this is pride month. Um, you know, I have a whole other thought about all these months because we haven't figured out how to live uh, in a way that uh, these, you know, Black History Month and Women's History Month and, and um, Pride Month, we haven't figured out how to integrate um, all of who we really are. But I do feel that it's really important for communities that are, um, have been um, ostracized and harmed that we don't get on a you know uh, soapbox and think that we know what someone else needs without asking. So I think your question is so important, which is how could I support you and what would have meaning for you and um, what are the ways that I could give to you which is very different than deciding, you know, because it would work for me, it would work for someone else. And I think that that's, that's a place where we're really, we could use our curiosity and our courage um, to be interested in someone else's world that is different than our own. Yes, that respect is so important, right? So important. You know, something that just came to mind to me and it's, it's because of a conversation that I had with some uh, young people recently was around inclusion. And the discussion they were having around it was really interesting because that, that word doesn't really resonate with them. Um, and, you know, they were kind of talking about how inclusion um, often means like, hey, you're welcome into our space, but it's still our space, you know? So it was, so it was seen as more of like, yeah, you can come, but you have to assimilate versus what they were speaking more, it was more celebration. And that like, no, you're not just welcome, but we're going to recreate this space together so that everyone has, has their space. Not you're just coming into something that we created, but you can come if you want kind of thing, you know? Um, and so what your, you know, your questionnaire just made me think about that too, of like, how do we celebrate um, different people? 
um, especially you know in, in spaces where they may not have been as welcomed in the past, um, and really have that feel or, or be authentic. And some of that can be around even what you're speaking about, like you know, and just kind of like not making assumptions. But also, I think there's something about um, creating and holding a space that truly feels open versus just welcoming. Mm -hmm. I think to me that that feels different. Yeah, there's a great essay I read about this that uh, about a lady who had worked in corporate entertainment for a long time. And she was always like the higher, everyone was always so happy about it. And then, but she never had authority. And she wrote this, I think she was working on a book about it. But anyway, that's exactly what you were saying is it's not enough, right? It's not enough just to... Um, have a have a, someone in the circle, but they have to be a part of the circle. They can't just you know sit on the side or something. Um, all right, more difficult emotions. Last stab at any difficult. I guess feeling rejected. Coming back to feeling rejected. That's our circle right there. Uh, any other difficult emotions we want to cover? <clears throat> I do want to say that um, joy can be a difficult emotion for people because we can become attached to our suffering. We can become identified with our traumas. And so there can be an addictive quality to the heavier feelings of grief and sorrow. So joy and I, happiness is a different emotion than joy, but the, but being free and having joy can be very difficult for people who have been identified by the, with their suffering. And so I, I do invite us tonight and as well as self-compassion that being compassionate toward the self can be a very difficult journey when being condemned, either because you were condemned by society or family or both, but ultimately condemned by the self. Um, can be a really difficult emotion to let the light and the softness of love and tenderness in. Yes. And anyone else have any last remarks before we close? You know, I would just add that coming out of, or likely still in what I like to call this trauma tsunami, you know, we're seeing trauma on the individual, the societal, the environmental, the political, all of these different levels that all of our emotions are really heightened. And so when we experience joy, it's really big. When we experience grief, it's really big. But one thing to keep in mind is that our isolation and our sense of loneliness can really enhance that. And so community is such a big, important piece of dealing with or in managing difficult emotions. We have to have a shared sense of community in order for us to heal. Yes, thank you. Tonya, any last thing? Yes, rest, 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 rest. <laughs> and that is something that I am really prioritizing and leaning into hard these days. You know, like this idea of you don't have to be doing something every minute of the day. You don't have to be producing something, you, you know, it'll, it'll be there. And really finding that balance, I think rest is so important. And particularly being in an industry too, where there's, you know, there's a lot of judgment, even if it's not self-judgment, it's coming from other places and like this constant push to do better, be better, look better, whatever it is, you know, 10 pounds here, do this next thing. It, it's always something and it could just like be a spiral where it's, you know, just getting to a point of depletion. Um, and I feel like sometimes that's what, what happens and then it's like, oh, maybe I should rest, but let's not get to that, <laughs> you know? Let's like try some, you know, have more balance there and really appreciating some rest. You don't, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pro nap. You know, <laughs> I am pro nap all the way. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Janice, last thought before we close. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, just reminding yourself that your worthiness is constant, um, similar to what other people have mentioned. It's not, 
based on the the next gig that you get or the project that comes up it's it's constant it ex- your worthiness exists because you exist um and so um yeah but it's been it's been a real pleasure hearing from everyone else too so thank you Thank you all. Thank you for the SAG, to the SAG After Foundation staff. And um, thank you to all 110 people who tuned in tonight to be with us and stayed. It looks like you stayed through the whole program and we deeply, deeply appreciate you. So thank you, everybody. It really did give me joy to talk to, to all of you and to meet all of you tonight. And thanks again to our audience. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.